prediction is according to that. So, uh, but this one, in case r is 0.01 or so, it's already, I mean, the dominant uh, signal is uh, this gravitational lensing signal here. So you got to do something. You, 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 need to, you need to detect this sort of uh, differences here. Whereas here, you have a dominant signal from primordial gravitational waves. And uh, so, uh, it's, so, so in that sense, the difficulty is, I mean, challenge is a little bit different. On ground-based project, you can try to detect something around this region. That's why, for instance, Quixote or any other experiment on ground are really doing active measurements. But this part, I believe, only comes from space, at least for very precise measurements are concerned. You can still try to touch on this part from ground in some ways, but ground, uh, you, you have lots of challenges such as the atmospheric fluctuation and stuff. Can yeah. I ask it? Since we are listening, can I ask another question? Sure. Very short. <laughs> so, the, the, so the experiment, the, the fact that the error bars are growing as you move away from the optimal point of close to 100, is, is, a, is instrumented, instrumentation related? Or is it a, a limitation on, on, how, on the difficulty to measure in those particular ends of the spectrum, of the multiple moment spectrum? So your error bars are really bigger towards... The, the purple ones... Um, so the cosmic variance. Is, is asking about the cosmic variance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it depends on how you really write down these uh, um, error bars. And uh, in this case, uh, Patric Patricio is right that uh, this, uh, I believe, includes the uh, cosmic variance. And, uh, cosmic variance means that you, you can get some finite statistics out of one universe when you test your theory. Because uh, um, yeah, you, you use a spherical harmonics to do this uh, power spectrum analysis. So for each L, you have uh, two L plus one components. That's the statistics you can gain okay. from one universe to test your uh, theory. And so and uh, but actually in real uh, experiment, there are some other stuff coming in like. Uh, Effect of a foreground removal and stuff. So, it's, uh, but this uh, this particular plot doesn't capture that. I don't know. Next question. Okay. Yeah, it's a very basic one because I'm also an ignorant on these inflation models. But you mentioned that the inflaton uh, is considered to be a scalar. This uh -huh. is because it's the probably the simplest option. Uh -huh. Or is there any theoretical, any other theoretical problem for other kind of particles to, to become an inflaton, to be an inflaton? Uh, it's a very interesting, I mean, good question. Um, uh, well, certainly some models, some particles are, I believe, useless <laughs> for inflation. Um, let's see. So. Um, well, first of all, um, you are treating vacuum here. That's the essence. So then it's really natural to think about uh, um, scalar particles without breaking any sort of uh, symmetry or, uh, you know, cosmological principle, stuff like that. But that, I, I probably, I'm not a theorist. I would not say it's impossible to think about something else. Um, you're talking about some, some tensor or whatever, um, yeah. But uh, we are really um, focusing on scalar particles. And then if you just talk about scalar particles, there are many candidates. Just if you talk about, say, superstring theory, there are lots of uh, you know, axion-like particles which could play this role. Yeah. Okay, uh, I think uh, thank again for the interesting. <laughs>